Now, UKIP's new leader, Paul Nuttall, has a big ambition to replace Labour as the main opposition party across the UK. This week, some senior Labour figures suggested UKIP could indeed grab some traditional socialist seats. But that is pretty odd, given that Mr Nuttall can sound more like a Thatcherite than a Pinko, and he joins me now. <laughs> uh, let me start. Are you serious that you can take out Labour seats in large numbers in the north of England? Yes, I am, because the Labour Party and its current guys, led by Jeremy Corbyn, it seems to be interested in the issues which swirl around the Islington dinner party. I don't believe that they represent working people anymore. And I think we can go into these communities, talk about issues that matter to working people, crime, social mobility, controlling immigration, and we can become the patriotic voice of working people. And you think that you can do well enough because UKIP has had a long history of getting lots and lots of votes, accumulating large numbers of people voting, but without getting the MPs. Yes, I mean, undoubtedly, the electoral system in the past has worked against us. What we've got to do now is target sensibly, drill down in these local communities, and under my leadership, I intend to use council halls and council chambers as the gateway to Westminster, and you'll see a lot more UKIP councillors working hard in their communities, but going into these Labour areas, knocking on doors, and ensuring we're talking about the things that matter to those people. Now, you've said right at the beginning of your leadership that you are a very different kind of leader from Nigel Farage, so what is the difference? Well, everyone who knows the pair of us within uh, the party knows that we're completely different people we have different relationships with people i'm not from any faction within the party i'm the only well, I'm clearly the only you sound different and you look yeah. different and all of that but in terms of your policies and your approach to politics what's the difference uh, well in many ways we're similar okay i mean nigel was my political mentor for many years i was his uh, deputy for six years but you know my real focus is making you keep that patriotic voice of working people. So why, can, why can you reach these working people in a way that he couldn't? Well, look, look Nigel took us from 0% in the opinion polls to getting 4 million votes at the general election and delivering us Brexit. You know, his, his legacy is immense. I've got big shoes to fill. I intend to do it. And, you know, my background, I think, plays into the fact that I can go into these Labour communities. I'm a comprehensive uh, schoolboy. You know, I come from a working class family in a working class area in Bootle. And I think we've got fantastic opportunities. On the other hand, you are a man of the right, not a man of the left. And those are mm. traditionally Labour socialist voters. And when they hear your views about privatising the NHS, well, for instance, they are going to be horrified. Well, let me make it perfectly clear. I mean, I stood uh, on a manifesto in 2015, uh, a UKIP manifesto, which I believe was the best manifesto out of any of the political parties, which made, ensured that we put £3 billion a year into the NHS mm. and kept it public. That's the policy at the time. But yep. you yourself said, 2011, I would argue that the very mm. existence of the NHS, the very existence of the NHS stifles competition and as competition uh, uh, creates quality and choice, improvements are restricted. Therefore, I believe as long as the NHS is the sacred cow of British politics, the longer the British people will suffer with a second-rate health service. You want to privatise the NHS. Firstly, nothing should be a sacred cow in British politics. All things should be up for debate. But, you know, in, but you don't, you don't in, hang on, in, in certain areas, like procurement, for example, I think the NHS could do better because in certain areas the NHS is paying 30% okay. over, the, over the odds for certain okay. drugs. If you brought in a private company, you could hire and fire on the results they got for the but you're, people. you're not talking about procurement there, you're talking about privatising the NHS, which for I, a lot of Labour voters is anathema. Under my leadership, UKIP will be committed to keeping right. the NHS in public hands and free at the point of delivery. Let me remind you of what you said at the, at the, at the famous hustings in 2011. Yeah. What about privatisation? <laughs> <laughs> privatisation? <laughs> uh, well, OK. Again, it's will be my fight, but some people might. I believe that the NHS is a... Uh, monolithic hangover from days gone by and unfortunately we're becoming, or fortunately shall I say, we're becoming an older population and quite frankly I would like to see more free markets introduced into the health service because this is the way it has to go. Who is? No, let's face reality here. This is where it has to go. We're an ageing population. That's yep. the reality. I'm sorry about the camera work. It wasn't a BBC it, crew, it, as it, you can okay. tell. Nevertheless, it's quite clear you want to privatise the NHS. Uh, look. Or you did. You, you, well, hang on. Unless you've hang changed on. your views. Hang on. You know, I made it clear we are an ageing population. We're a, we're a growing population as well. At some point in this century, years on, we may well have to have a debate how we fund the NHS in this country. But I want to make it clear. Under my leadership, UKIP will be committed to putting more money into the NHS, but onto the front line, into nurses, 
into doctors, into midwives, because it cannot okay. be right. Let me finish. It cannot be right that in England today, 51% of people who work for the NHS are not clinically qualified. You are sounding like you are now massaging the sacred cow. Have you changed no. your views? No, I think that everything in politics should be up for debate. Nothing should be parked, because if you don't debate things, things never improve. And one day it might go private. Well, maybe at some point in years to come, within this century, we'll have to have right. this debate, but it won't be under my leadership in UK. OK, let's talk about welfare. Um, again, a lot of people are very concerned about cuts to universal credit. Would mm. you reverse the cuts to universal credit? Uh, I, I, I probably uh, would not reverse uh, the cuts. I think the welfare budget in this country is... It's too it, high. It, it, well, it, it, I think so, and we need to do something. We cannot be right that we have 1.7 million people in Britain today who are unemployed, 600,000 of so, them, by the way. Hang on, let me finish. 600,000 of them are between 18 and 24. And this goes back to the key issue of immigration, actually, because last week, we allowed, uh, the figures came out that we allowed this year a city the size of Newcastle-upon-Tyne uh, Newcastle to come to this country. That is insane when you've got 1.7 million people unemployed. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is to get our own people back into work first before we bring people in to do other jobs. Your views on immigration won't be a terrible surprise to most people, I suspect. Mm. But you've also expressed quite strong views on social policies. You want to bring back hanging for child killers, for instance, uh, and you want to cut the abortion <laughs> limits. Well, look, they are... And in both cases, you want a referendum, is that right? Uh, hang on. They are my personal views. For example, on the issue of child killers, uh, if there was a referendum tomorrow and that was on the table, I would vote in favour that there's other people in UKIP who would vote differently. That is not going to be UKIP policy, it's a personal view. Would you like a referendum on that? Uh, UKIP's policy has always been that if, say, 10% of people sign a petition in a small, uh, in a small time frame, mm. it would trigger referendums. It works in Switzerland, it can work in this country as well. It's called direct democracy. All right, you'll have seen the story in the newspapers today. Yeah. Do, do you have a PhD from Liverpool Hope University? No, and I've never claimed I've got a PhD. It's on your website. Uh, it it's not on my website, it's on a LinkedIn page that wasn't put up by us and we don't know where it's come from, OK? So I've never a, claimed that at all. did you ever play professional football for Tranmere Rovers? I played for five years for Tranmere Rovers as a schoolboy and a youth team player. I've never claimed that I've been a professional. It was one press release in 2010 put out by a press officer who knows nothing about football. You have a very over-enthusiastic researcher. Do you still have that enthusiastic researcher? Well, I don't know where that comment has come from. <laughs> that, that was to do with the Daily Mail story today, uh, which said that I had a PhD from Liverpool Hope. I've never claimed... And in fact, actually, if you listen to Nothing interviews, to it's nothing to do with me. And if you listen to interviews I've given over the past five years, I've always spoke about wanting to finish my PhD, which okay. I started in 2004. Final very quick question, if I may. Do you think the way things are coming out in the papers at the moment, the Conservatives are going to betray the Brexit vote? I think we're on a slippery slope. I think what David Davis said last week when he spoke about paying a membership fee indicates that the Conservatives are thinking about keeping us in the single market, the Norway option, which means we won't be able to control our borders, we will have to pay a membership fee, we can't sign our own free trade deals, and indeed we'll have to comply with EU regulations and directives. That's that not, is not what people that voted That is not what people voted for on June the 23rd. They voted for a clean Brexit. Paul Nuttall, thank you very much thank indeed you. for talking to us. I want to replace the Labour Party and make UKIP the patriotic voice of working people. UKIP says it will take the fight to Labour in its very heartlands, places like the north of England, places like here in Barnsley, where 70% of people voted for Brexit and where in the last general election UKIP came a strong second in two of the town's parliamentary seats. The town's motto, it means judge us by our actions. It's a great town. It's surely in the back of Dan Jarvis's mind. He's been the Labour MP here since 2011. Do you worry that they're going to vote UKIP at the next election? We shouldn't be complacent about the fact that a resurgent UKIP could provide a significant challenge for us, and we've got to make sure that they don't do that. The big issue here is immigration, in a town that he says feels left behind. And he's worried Labour doesn't currently have the answers. We're not getting it quite right just yet, because we haven't demonstrated to the public that we understand their concerns. I don't think that we were able to do that in the previous parliament. And I think there is, there's still a specific concern that people look at us and don't take it as seriously as they take it. We can't ever afford to go into a general election with the public thinking that we don't take the issue of immigration seriously. Diane Abbott doesn't seem to think there should be an immigration target. You do. 
I think if you're trying to achieve anything, it's useful to have a target because it's quite a, a useful way, way marker as to whether you're making progress. So my own view is that there should be some sort of target. Uh, I think it's a bit early to say precisely what that should be or how it should work. But my instinct is if you want to demonstrate to the public that you take this very seriously, the notion that you should have some sort of target is the right one. Suzanne Evans arrived by train, but the plan is to park tanks on the lawns of places like this. Fresh from coming second in UKIP's recent leadership contest, she's now the chair of the party's policy committee. That's why we invited her to get a taste of what people in Barnsley think. Nigel Farage, oh, that's great. Thanks. I think for UKIP it's a fantastic party. You I do. think it's a party that sticks up for the working class people. I think they uh, are standing for the beliefs of the people in the north of England more than in yeah. the south of England. Her impromptu canvassing session here went well, but the challenge for the new leader, Paul Nuttall, will be to break the voting habits of generations of Labour supporters. With Paul Nuttall as our new leader, we have a real opportunity here. A brutal man, Liverpool, working class accent, uh, you know, a guy who's grown up in the north of England um, and, and can talk to people in a different way that perhaps Nigel Farage did. But people here aren't stupid, are they? If Nigel Farage couldn't do it, why will Paul Nuttall, who just happens to have a northern accent, make any difference? I think, um, I, I think Paul can reach out more. And I think with Nigel standing down as leader, I think also there will be more people in the front line of UKIP. You know, we've, I think, perhaps rightly sometimes been criticised for being a one-man band. I think that's going to change very swiftly and very dramatically, and I think we've seen that already. So will you have a target list here in the north? Yes, absolutely. I think you know we'll be looking to target in particular those seats where there's a Labour member of Parliament who doesn't want to leave the European Union, but his constituents or her constituents want to get out. They've got to be our top priorities, particularly if we're looking at constituencies where we ran Labour a close second in the general election. UKIP came second to Labour in 44 constituencies in last year's general election and that was before people in most of those areas then voted this year to leave the EU. With that in mind, Paul Nuttall predicts his party will have at least 10 MPs after the next one.